Hey guys. All right, so we'll just go over week five slides. Um, you guys have a quiz next week. For everything from week three to week five. Okay. So let me sure you're ready for that. Okay. So let's talk about international strategic alliances. This is all going to be very easy stuff, guys. Okay. So basically, international strategic alliance is typically defined as a collaborative arrangement between firms headquartered in different countries. Basically, one is a company in 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 Canada and another company in Brazil, and they come together. Um, they collaborate together in order to have a um, in order to have a strategic advantage over over other companies. Um, partnering firms remain legally independent after the formation of an alliance. Right? They stay. They get their. They'll have an alliance, like a strategic alliance, but they won't merge company it's not a merger or an acquisition it's just an alliance where they work together so for example the company i work at right now um we have a a really big um a really big company in the industry that uses us to manufacture their equipment so we have a strategic alliance with them we don't manufacture for their co for their competitors when we manufacture for them so it's a strategic alliance that we have with these guys and anytime they need something they ask us Three types of strategic alliances are joint venture, equity strategic alliance, and a non-equity strategic alliance. Okay, so let's, let's talk some more about that. Okay, so basically a joint venture is when um, a it's when two established companies come together to form a secondary company. Okay, so when company A, such as, let's just call them Coca-Cola, company B, we'll call them Lay's. Let's say they come together to put together a new company that sells a drink and chip combo. I don't know, something like that. Okay. So basically that's a joint venture. Those two come together to create something else. Um, if, if both of them own 50% of the company, that means it's a 50-50 uh, joint venture. If Coca-Cola owns more than Lay's, that means it's a majority owned venture. Okay. Very easy stuff. So, Equity strategic alliance. So an equity strategic alliance is created when one company purchases a certain equity percentage of the other company. So if a company A purchases 40% of the equity in company B and an equity strategic alliance can be formed. So basically if Coca-Cola came and said, you know what, <clears throat> I'm not going to buy your entire company. I want to buy 40% of Lay's company so that we can come, we can work together as a strategic alliance in a strategic alliance in order to capture more of the market. That would be an equity strategic alliance. And then you have the non-equity strategic alliance. Basically, is an alliance created when uh, two or more companies sign a contractual relationship to pool their resources and capabilities together. Okay? Um, so you're not basically asking for any money. You're not asking for any equity. You're not asking for any of that. All you're doing is saying, okay, we're coming to an agreement where you and I will work together in order to reach a certain goal. So a joint venture is when they come together and create another one. Um, and... Equity strategic alliance is one person when one company buys shares of the other, and then a non-equity is when they just come together with no monetary, um, no monetary need to, to purchase or or do any of that stuff. Okay, they just come together as an agreement to work together to capture more of the market. All right. So letter of intent and memorandum of understanding. So basically, these are two things that are done. Well, letter of intent is done heavily in my industry. I get letter of intents all the time. Basically, what, it, what it let, <gasps> a letter of intent is and a memorandum of understanding is, so LOI is a document often used in mergers and acquisitions that uh, records the preliminary terms of an agreement. So it's often in use in mergers and acquisitions, but it's also very, very commonly used in the construction industry. So before a contract is sent out, a letter of intent is sent out that basically notes everything that needs to be completed for that job. Once that is, that's basically a, it gives you a general, general idea of what the contract is going to look like. So you sign that, you send it back and then you get the contract and you sign and send the contract. So instead of having issues when, cause writing a contract is, it takes a long time. Okay. So it takes a lot of money and a lot of time to have a lawyer write up a contract. So basically what they do is they send you a letter of intent that's written up by someone in the company that basically outlines 
everything that that, sh that should be on the contract. Once you're in agreement with it, they send the contract out to get to get completed by the lawyers, and the lawyers send it over to us. That way, we're not constantly changing things in the contract and having to pay the lawyers all the time. Letter of intent is is used to kind of negate that. So, though the letter of intent is non-binding, which means that even if you sign it, you don't have to do the job until you get the contract. It's an important outline of the key terms that the parties involved in the transaction have agreed upon. Okay, so basically, like I said, it's just a guideline for all the all the terms in the agreement that we've agreed upon. Okay, what else? A memorandum of understanding. So MOU is a document that describes the broad outlines of an agreement that two or more parties have reached. Okay. The primary difference between the two is that letter of intent is not binding, whereas memorandum of understanding is considered binding and carries weight in court of law. So basically, they're the same thing. It's just it's just that an MOU is it carries weight and is and is legally binding. All right. What are international sales agents? We talked about this before, right? Very easy. It's basically an individual um, or a company of individuals that acts as a sales representative of, of, of a company overseas. Okay, so uh, they represent the company as a company ambassador. They are direct point of contact for a company in each country they are located in. So basically, if you're a Canadian company and you have offices in Europe, you have an office in, uh, let's say you have an office in England, you have an office in Spain, you have an office in... Malaysia, you have an office in China, stuff like that. Though you will be appointed, you will have to appoint sales agents who are doing the sales for your company within that location, within that geogra uh, ge geographic location. So that's basically what international sales agent is. Single transaction commission basically is when you have a when you have international sales agents, you have any type of agent. Um, if they get paid based off commission, so they don't get a salary, they don't get any of that stuff. They only get paid based off what they sell. So it could be money based off of um, uh, how how much volume they're selling or the selling price. So that's just a single transaction commission. A lot of salespeople work on that. I don't work on a um, single transaction commission. I have a I have a because of the um, type of work that I do. It's very technical. And you have to do a lot of work just to get the sale. And you have to make the company look good. You have to, uh, like for me, the stuff that I do, they offer me a salary plus single transaction commissions. So I get a, I get a salary, which helps take care of all my bills and everything. And then I get, I get commissions based off all the sales that I make. So for me, that's my favorite because you get to control the amount of money you make every year. So I know for a fact that I'll make X amount of dollars based off my salary. Now, commissions could be anything. I could make, I could make, let's say I make $60,000 in salary. I can make $130,000 just by my commissions alone. So it really depends on how much I work, how much I want to work, how much I want to put in. But at the same time, my bills are being paid as well. So, that's my favorite type of um, sales structure. Any good salesperson gets paid a salary plus commission. Okay. All right. And any real good sales sales uh, sales um, professional knows that a smaller salary with bigger commissions is best because if you're a good salesperson, you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars just like that. All right. What else you got? International distribution agreement. <clears throat> it's where in, it's an agreement where an individual or company signs a contract to purchase, store, and then sell a foreign country's products into their own. Okay, so what you're doing is distributing. Distribution means when you purchase a bunch of goods from a from a manufacturer or a company, and then you try and sell them in your own stores or from your own warehouse. That's what distribution means. Okay, is different from sales. The sales means you're not touching the product, or whatever. It gets shipped directly from uh, the warehouse that the that the manufacturer owns to the client. Distribution is different, right? So, for example, a company in India buys 10,000 pairs of shoes from a famous shoe manufacturer in China. They receive the shoes, put them on sale in their stores, 
an online warehouse and sell it to the customer base, to their own customer base. So basically, as a distribution agreement, you want to go to a company that's already big, already doing a lot of numbers. Say, hey, listen, I want to sell your product into my into my country, into my demographic, to my to my customer base. So okay, fine. Here's a here's an order for a hundred. You know, ten. Uh, if you want ten thousand, I can make you ten thousand and ship it over to you. So they give it to you at a wholesale price, basically. Okay, so what's an international franchise agreement? Basically, an international franchise agreement is just a agreement to open up someone else's business in your home country. Okay, so very, very similar. Um... What else? An agreement to open someone else's international business in your own country. Very, very sim simple. You guys know what a franchise is. Licensing is basically a um, contract between two parties known as a licensor and licensee in a typical licensing agreement. A licensor grants the licensee the right to produce and sell goods, apply a brand name or trademark, or use patented technology owned by the licensor. So if Google is letting companies like Huawei, uh, Nokia, all these com companies that are that are outside of the US use their software, their Android system, their operating system, that means they're licensing it from Google. Foreign direct investment, very, very, very simple. Basically, a foreign direct investment is made by a firm or an individual in a country, in one country, into business interests located in another country. So, FDI takes place in investor establishes foreign business operations or acquires foreign business assets in a foreign company. However, FDIs are distinguished from portfolio investments in which an investor merely purchases equities of foreign based companies. So it's they're different than you than you and me buying a stock that is trading out of the US or a stock or of a company that is out in Europe or or around um, Africa. Okay? That's different. That's not a foreign direct a foreign direct investment would be a company in China buying a company in in the in Canada, that's a foreign direct investment. So, for example, we okay, let's say in the U.S. Okay, in the U.S., so many companies are being bought out by China and India. If you not let's, even if we don't talk about you, let's say we talk about something that you guys might know. Okay, so Land Rover, Range Rover. You guys know what Range Rover is, right? Those are those those were owned initially by a Brit by by the UK by British people and what happened was India Tata Motors came in and purchased Land Rover Range Rover the rate the whole the whole Land Rover um, the line so that's a foreign direct investment they went in and boom they bought a foreign company that's a foreign direct investment okay all right um, guys you have a you have your quiz too next week it's on slides week three four five it should be you know not not difficult like I said I am very, very, very keen on marking you guys for participation. Anybody could sit at home and, and cheat and, and get these quizzes done right. It really, really comes down to class participation for you guys, all right? So I'll see you guys in class.